a student's overview of the ageless wisdom was carefully compiled from the following books by Alice A. Bailey. A Treatise on Cosmic Fire Esoteric Psychology, Volumes 1 and 2 Esoteric Healing Esoteric Astrology The Rays and the Initiations Students are encouraged to download the free PDF version of this overview by following the link in the video's description, or to order a printed copy at cost from the bookpatch.com, but are advised to read the original, unabridged books in order to gain deeper insight into the ageless wisdom. Students are also invited to join our online study group at facebook.com slash groups, slash students of the ageless wisdom. Chapter 33 Esoteric Psychology Volume 2 Section 3 Esoteric Psychology 2 Introductory Remarks The unfoldment of the human consciousness is signalized sequentially by the recognition of life after life, of being after being and the realization that these lives are in themselves the sum total of all the potencies and energies whose will is to create and to manifest. In dealing, however, with these energies and forces, it is impossible to express their appearance, quality and purpose except in symbolic form, and the following points should therefore be remembered. 1. The personality consciousness is that of the third aspect of divinity, the creator aspect. This works in matter and substance in order to create forms through which the quality may express itself and so demonstrate the nature of divinity on the plane of appearances. 2. The egoic consciousness is that of the second aspect of divinity, that of the soul expressing itself as quality and as the determining subjective color of the appearances. This naturally varies, according to the ability of the soul in any form to master its vehicle, matter, and to express innate quality through the outer form. 3. The monadic consciousness is that of the first aspect of divinity, that which embodies divine life purpose and intent and which uses the soul in order to demonstrate through that soul the inherent purpose of God. It is this that determines the quality. The soul embodies that purpose and will of God as it expresses itself in seven aspects. The monad expresses the same purpose as it exists, unified in the mind of God himself. This is a form of words conveying practically nothing to the average thinker. As these three expressions of the one great life are realized by man on the physical plane, he begins to tune in consciously on the emerging plan of deity, and the whole story of the creative process becomes the story of God's realized purpose. All that concerns humanity at this time is the necessity for a revelation and a gradual apprehension of the plan which will enable man to work consciously and intelligently, realize the relation of form and quality to life, produce that inner transmutation which will bring into manifestation the fifth kingdom in nature, the kingdom of souls. All this has to be accomplished in the realm of conscious awareness or response, through the medium of steadily improving vehicles or response mechanisms, and with the aid of spiritual understanding and interpretation. With the bigger questions we will not deal. With the consciousness of the life of God as it expresses itself in the three Subhuman kingdoms, we need not concern ourselves. We shall deal entirely with the following three points. 1. With the strictly human consciousness as it begins with the process of individualization and consummates in the dominant personality. 2. With the egoic consciousness, 
which is that of the solar angel as it begins with the preparation for initiation on the path of discipleship and consummates in the perfected master. 3. With the monadic realization. This is a phrase that means absolutely nothing to us, for it concerns the consciousness of the planetary logos. This begins to be realized at the third initiation, dominating the soul and working out through the personality. End of page 167 Man, the average human being, is a sum total of separative tendencies, of uncontrolled forces and of disunited energies which slowly and gradually become coordinated, fused, and blended in the separative personality. Man, the solar angel, is the sum total of those energies and forces which are unified, blended and controlled by that tendency to harmony which is the effect of love and the outstanding quality of divinity. Man, the living monad, is the veiled reality and that which the angel of the presence hides. He is the synthetic expression of the purpose of God, symbolized through revealed, divine quality and manifested through the form. Appearance, quality, life, again this ancient triplicity confronts us. What is initiation? Initiation might be defined in two ways. It is first of all the entering into a new and wider dimensional world by the expansion of a man's consciousness so that he can include and encompass that which he now excludes, and from which he normally separates himself in his thinking and acts. It is, secondly, the entering into man of those energies which are distinctive of the soul and of the soul alone, the forces of intelligent love and of spiritual will. These are dynamic energies, and they actuate all who are liberated souls. This process of entering into and of being entered into should be a simultaneous and synthetic process, an event of the first importance. The growth of soul influence. It should be borne in mind that individual separative success is in itself an evidence of soul activity, for every individual is a living soul actuating the lower sheaths of bodies, and proceeding to 1. Build sheath after sheath, life after life, that will be increasingly adequate to its own expression. 2. Produce that sensitivity in the sheaths, sequentially and finally simultaneously, which will enable them to respond to an ever-increasing sphere or measure of divine influence. 3. Integrate the three sheaths into a unity which for three and sometimes seven lives, occasionally eleven lives, will function as a dominant personality in some field of wide expression, using the energy of ambition to bring this about. 4. Reorient the lower individual self so that the realm of its desires and the satisfaction of personality achievement will eventually be relegated to their rightful place. 5. Galvanize the self-assertive man into that realization of new achievements which will direct his steps onto the path of discipleship and eventually onto the path of initiation. 6. Substitute for past, necessarily self-interested and personal ambition, the needs of the group and the goal of world service. Here are indicated two crises in the subjective life of the soul. 1. The crisis wherein the soul, blinded, limited and handicapped by form, begins to work in the quarry of experience, far from its own country with inadequate tools, and in complete temporary self-imposed ignorance of the design, or pattern. 2. The crisis which comes very much later in the soul's experience, wherein the soul knows more clearly the design, and in which much material has been prepared. 
the soul is no longer blind, and can now work in collaboration with other souls in the preparation of the material for the final temple of the Lord. The soul, incarnate in human form, places in that temple his particular contribution to the whole, which might be stated symbolically to be a, a stone placed in the foundations, typical of the consecrated physical life. b, a column in the temple itself, typical of the desire or aspirational life. c, a design upon the tracing board, which coincides with the great design, and which is that fragment of that design which the individual had to supply and in search of which he went forth. d, a radiance or light, which will augment the Shekinah, the light which ever shineth in the east. End of page 168 Three things emerge in connection with the task of the soul as it appropriates sheath after sheath for expression. A the condition of the substance of the sheaths which determines the equipment. b. Responsiveness to the pattern, which is dependent upon the stage of conscious development. c. Ability to work in connection with the plan, which is dependent upon the number and quality of the crises undergone. All this takes place as the soul passes, time after time through the experience of physical incarnation, later, progress is made consciously from plane to plane and this is undertaken with clear intent. The work is facilitated and progresses with increased rapidity as the soul, actively, intelligently and intuitively, begins to work with the pattern, transmitting from crisis to crisis, each marking an expansion of consciousness a newer reach of development and a fresh grasp of the great design, coupled with a better and more adequate equipment through which to carry on the work. The above should prove to be immediately practical. Initiation carried to its consummation, as far as humanity is concerned, produces the liberated master of the wisdom, free from the limitations of the individual garnering the fruits of the individualization process and functioning increasingly as the solar angel, because focused primarily in the inner spiritual body. We have thus touched upon the three great divisions which mark the soul's progress towards its goal. a. Through the process of individualization, the soul arrives at a true self-consciousness and awareness in the three worlds of its experience. The actor in the drama of life masters his part. b. Through the process of initiation, the soul becomes aware of the essential nature of divinity. Participation in full consciousness with the group and the absorption of the personal and individual into the whole, characterize this stage on the path of evolution. c. Finally comes that mysterious process wherein the soul becomes so absorbed into that supreme reality and synthesis through identification that even the consciousness of the group fades out, except when deliberately recovered in the work of service. It should be noted here, therefore, that there are, literally, two points of identification in the long experience of the soul. One marks the stage wherein form, matter, substance, time and space are controlling factors, and imprison the soul within their types of consciousness. This connotes identification with form life. The other connotes identification with all that lies outside of form expression and is released from it. Basic Premises With this preamble, we will pass on to the consideration of the mechanism and of that which infuses it and motivates it with life and intelligence. Certain basic premises are recognized and can, therefore, be very briefly mentioned. 1. 
the soul informs the mechanism in two ways and through two points of contact in the body. A. The thread of life is anchored in the heart. The life principle is there to be found, and from that station it pervades the entire physical body through the medium of the blood stream, for the blood is the life. B. The thread of consciousness or of intelligence is anchored in the head, in the region of the pineal gland, and from that station of perception it orders or directs the physical plane activities, through the medium of the brain and the nervous system. 2. The directive activity of the soul, or its authoritative grasp upon the mechanism of the body, is dependent for its extent upon the point of development, or upon the so-called age of the soul. The soul is ageless from the human angle, and what is really meant is the length of time that a soul has employed the method of physical incarnation. End of page 169 3. The result of this twofold hold upon the mechanism during the past ages has been the conditioning of the material, in conjunction with its own inherent conditioned nature. A form is produced which is adequate to the temporary need of the soul and which is a reflection, in time and space, of its relative age or point of development. This, therefore, produces the type of brain the conformation of the body, the condition of the endocrine system, and consequently the set of qualities, the type of mental reaction, and the character with which any given subject enters into life upon the physical plane. From that point, the work proceeds. This work might be regarded as an effort to intensify the hold which the divine thinker has upon the mechanism. This will lead to a wiser, fuller direction, a deeper realization of the purpose, and an effort to clear the way for the soul by the institution of those practices which tend towards right conduct, right speech, and good character. The thought underlying this paragraph links the conclusions of the materialistic school of psychologists with the introspectionist school and those schools which posit a self a soul or a spiritual entity, and shows that both groups are dealing with facts, and that both must play their united parts in training the aspirant in the new age. 4. As the introspective method is pursued, and as we study the human subject, we discover that underlying the human body in all its parts, and constituting a definite part of the human apparatus, there is a vehicle which has been called the etheric body, composed entirely of threads of force which, in their turn, form the channels along which still more subtle and varying types of energy flow. These are, in their turn, conditioned during manifestations by the status of the soul. These threads underlie and interpenetrate the entire body and the nervous system and are in reality the actuating power of the nervous system. Their responsiveness to impacts, outer and inner, is unbelievably great. The nervous reactions of the disciple and highly developed person, whose etheric body is in close rapport with his nervous system, is beyond the average comprehension. 5. The sum total of the nerves, with the millions of nadis or thread counterparts in the etheric body, form a unit, and this unit, according to the teaching of the ageless wisdom, has in it points of focus for different types of energy. These are called force centers, and upon these depend the life experience of the soul and its expression, and not upon the body. They are the factors which condition the glandular system of the body. 6. This subjective and objective system governs the manifestation of the soul on the physical plane. It indicates to those who can see in truth, 
the grasp or hold that the soul has upon its instrument, it can be seen whether that grasp is occasional and partial or whether it is entire and whole. This is most wonderfully indicated in a certain Masonic grip, which marks a climax in the experience of the candidate to the mysteries. 7. I previously referred to the main channel of communication between the soul and its mechanism as a. the center at the base of the spine b. the center at the top of the head, where the most important center in the body is situated, from the standpoint of the soul. There is its point of entry and exit, there is the great radio station of reception and the distributing center for direction. C. The spleen. This is a subsidiary center and organ in connection with the heart center. 8. These two subjective and subconscious streams of energy cross each other in the region of the spleen and their form across in the human body, as they traverse each other's lines of force. This is the correspondence in the human body to the cross of matter, spoken of in connection with deity. Consciousness and life form a cross. The downpouring stream of life from the heart and the stream of life-giving energy from the spleen pass on, after crossing each other and producing a whirlpool of force, into the solar plexus region. From thence they are very definitely drawn together as one stream at a certain stage in the life of the advanced aspirant. There they merge with the sum total of energies, using the three points referred to, the head, the base of the spine and the spleen, as a definite mode of communication, of distribution and of control, and finally of ultimate withdrawal, consciously or unconsciously at the moment of death or in the technique of inducing that stage of control known as samadhi. End of page 170 9. When the directing agent in the head, deliberately and by an act of the will, raises the accumulated energies at the base of the spine, he draws them into the magnetic field of the centers up the spine and blends them with the dual energy emanating from the spleen. The spinal tract with its five centers then awakens into activity, and finally all the forces are gathered together into one fused and blended stream of energy. Three things then happen. 10. The Kundalini fire is raised and immediately burns away all the etheric webs which are the protective barriers, separating the various centers. 11. The etheric body intensifies its vitality, and the physical body is consequently powerfully vitalized, galvanized, and energized. 12. The entire aura is coordinated and illumined and the soul can then, at will, withdraw from its physical vehicle in full waking consciousness, or stay in it as an incarnated son of God, whose consciousness is complete on the physical plane, the astral plane, and on the mental levels, as well as in the three aspects of lower mind, causal consciousness and nervonic realization. This process finds its consummation at the third initiation. In the life of the aspirant, the power to cause this tremendous happening is dependent upon the carrying forward of the inner subjective and spiritual work previously described as the building of the bridge on the mental plane between the above mentioned three aspects. End of chapter 33